Okay, I'm going to talk on what is open when no data and where is trust, and what I'm going to, re, um, to focus on is prob some of the problem representations that are underpinning open science that I've encountered uh, during the time that I've been following this de these developments. So it, even if we're not always talking specifically on that, I want you to keep that question in the back of your head. If open science is the solution, then what is the problem in the various policy documents that we encounter all the time? And I also want to, to do that, I want to take you back in time to when it all began with the freaks in the library and the labs uh, in Budapest and Berlin. When these um, two statements were formulated, the Budapest Open Access Initiative and the Berlin Declaration, the one in 2001 to the other one in 2003. And of course, as we've heard, these seemed naive at the time, and they were, and I'm the first to write under on that. After all, I wrote a, an entire thesis just outlining the problems with, the, with this uh, early uh, open access uh, development. However, they were also very, very <laughs> inspired uh, declarations that carried the pathos and of the time. And what they were out after was they wanted to change the way science was distributed, the way scholarship was done, but as, as, and they formulated that as a public good. They talked about curious minds, uh, and, they, they, and the people who were able to do that were the scientists. It is the willingness of scientists and scholars to publish the fruits of their research in scholarly journals without payment for the sake of inquiry and knowledge. And about, and, and uh, in the, in, if you read these entire statements, the, what they identified as problems, as barriers, were publishing houses and, 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 um, and their business practices. And the reason why they wanted to do that was to unite humanity in a common quest for inquiry and knowledge. Uh, and also less obvious in the Berlin Declaration to sort of to unite to um, for a global representation of human knowledge uh, to, to guarantee access to our cultural heritage and uh, to have sustainable uh, uh, access to, to science and research. And uh, actually the Berlin Declaration also already included uh, data and raw, da raw da data and uh, other multimedia materials, interestingly, which the Budapest uh, Declaration left out. So that was uh, yeah, almost 15 years ago. In the meantime, as we heard, open access has become mainstream. And this is what happened. In the open access has moved from being this sort of ideal of uh, inquiry for human knowledge and global, um, a, common, a common sort of quest for, for, for truth. It has become a, uh, a, a business model. On the left-hand side, you see the, the Finch report. That sort of was a report uh, that uh, commissioned by the UK government uh, that changed the entire publishing practices in the UK to open access, uh, but one specific model, the gold open access model, and one specific model of gold as well, the pay for publish open access model. And here you have new words uh, that sort of started to infiltrate the, the discourse over the, the, the 10 years or so preceding those uh, those documents, uh, you, you talk, there's talk about efficiency in the research process, it's, it talks about increases in the amount of information, reductions in time spent, a lot of acceleration, increased returns on investment and so forth. Of course, and in Horizon 2020, this, uh, it's about generating growth, it's about improved quality of results, it's to speed up in innovation, it's about improved transparency and so forth. So what you have here is really a shift from sort of a, um, an idea where scientists are doing something for the common good, sort of an idea, ide idealist version of why we do research, into sort of a very, very um, a business and an economic and, and, and a way of um, rephrasing open access and open science as something that's very closely connected to how we do business, really. It's a part of today's dominant economism and, and quantification. Of course, if you go to the, if you look at how the Budapest Open Access Declaration was formulated, it's not a surprise because in these form, in these sort of early days, what was left out was the ways in which publishing practices and and and, uh, and material collection practices are really entangled across the research uh, research practices, and it was sort of they, they were disconnected from each other, and in that way, 
there was an openness to, for it to be translated into business models. And that was also why it was successful, as we have heard before. So today, uh, just now, uh, the European Commission uh, released a, a, a booklet called Open Innovation, Open Science, Open to the World, A Vision for Europe. And here, open science has shifted even further. And you can see why, it's, and the talk is a lot about disruption. There's a comparison to the sort of the disruptions that happened in e-commerce and, and other, uh, uh, and all kinds of parts of the labor market. And open access is seen as important and is disruptive as e-commerce has been for retail. There's comparison made to Airbnb, sort of the gig economy also, although here, here it sort of relates to citizen science, but it also makes us think about the precariousness that many researchers actually work under. Uh, and it's also, um, it's also the interesting thing is also that open access is not, does not mean free science here, which is commonly understood to mean free science before, suddenly the free part of science has been removed again, because of course if it is a business model there has to be safeguards for, for intellectual property. And so very much talk is about um, a, a, of acceleration and demand for open science in this sort of framing can also be seen, I think, as advancing at an, an enclosure, an administrative enclosure and a managerial process of control and evaluation. These demands are also expressions of a shift of control, I think, of the science community to increasingly invisible research infrastructures and to an apparatus of administration, as well as subscribing to an ideal of entrepreneurialism and constant acceleration, which already is a problem in science. The disruption um, also draws on to another uh, image that is recurring, and it paints scientists in a, in a certain way in these documents as unwilling to share. If you have the last quote here, which is also taken from the same document, the days of keeping our research results to ourselves are over. There is far more to gain from sharing data and letting others access and analyze that data. So, which days are over? Here, I have a quote from uh, Marie Curie, uh, how she writes about Pierre in the bi biography of Pierre Curie, which is taken from a book by Eva Hemmung Schwitzin. And here Marie Curie uh, describes her efforts in this way, or their efforts. Our investigation has started a general scientific movement, a similar work was undertaken in other countries. Towards these efforts, Pierre Curie maintained the most disinterested uh, and liberal attitude. With my agreement, he refused to draw any material profit from our recovery. We took no copyright and published without reserve all the results of our research as well as the exact processes of the preparation of radium. In addition, we gave to those interested whatever information they asked of us. This was of great benefit to the radium industry and so it continues. So really, what she does here, she, she subscribes very much to Merton, the Mertonian norms of science that we have heard about before. There communism, universalism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. So really, these days, this is not really what is at, at stake here. It seems that something else is going on. And I think we can find clues if we turn to two concepts that are implicit in all these snippets in policy documents that we of openness, and that's, that is trust and time, acceleration, mainly. Jeffrey Bauker. Uh, SDS scholar expresses it like that. One of the founding myths of scientific practice is that science is carried out in an eternal present. From it all, external influence has been banished. Uh, and this idea of science, that it is regarded that it is context-free and doesn't have an external influence and that it's always, always, always now, is also what makes it possible to sort of accelerate it constantly and to have it it's projected into a future that never comes. It also relates to something else, to the archive, which is, um, um, which is, uh, which is, which is what the libraries and the da data storage uh, are, are concerned with, and that is as, uh, it shows a tension in knowledge production that is based on temporality. Many have commented on the acceleration of academic work and the projectification and that that is a problem for how academic work is carried out. Academic time is increasingly structured to a detail level and control and autonomy are lost. 
so slowness is not really a problem. Um, I want to talk about a case that I encountered myself in my own research that I carried out with my colleague Sarah Schellberg, where we carried out interviews and, views and document studies at uh, big science facilities that are currently being built in, in southern Sweden, and where we approached uh, the material that we gathered by asking the question, when are data, at which point can they be open? The thing is, data always are in the making. They are not just there. And it's quite hard to sort of imagine and do something with these magic moments that can be established when things do become data. That happens at different points in time. So, we, um, we use this question to investigate data and its making during the setting up and the construction of two large-scale research facilities. And the notion of making of data does here not refer to data as they are being produced during the carrying out of an experiment or an observation, but rather to how they are made possible by setting up and planning for the production, storage and use, and even for the limits and strategic roles and other effects of data. And what we encountered was that data are very diverse. Uh, some people refer to data as managing the flow, that sort of uh, researchers sitting in front of, uh, f uh, in front of um, terminals, just sort of uh, viewing data coming in, and they re refer to Netflix. Others uh, talked about data as something that's very much something to relate to in policies and regulations. And you have the sort of conflict of the, the idea of forever that is sort of uh, expressed in policies and the, and, the, and the three months that actually the researchers are talking about. Um, that you have an infrastructure for, for something that actually does not serve the needs of the research community. And this is particularly interesting, the idea that data is, something, is going to do something in the future. We have researchers uh, and uh, people working with research data management and public relations expressing themselves like that. As far as I know, there's nothing more going to happen to the data after six years than there is after 20 years. It is not fair to compare the uselessness of 10-year-old data today for how it will be in the future. Better metadata might, might make today's data more useful in the future. So, this idea that data is going to achieve something in the future is really interesting uh, in the sense that it, is, it sort of keeps up an old theme that always has been connected to how science and technology are, are connected to development and the future. There's always a race for the future and acceleration that something is going to happen later on. And the open science and open access discourse is very much connected to that. But the question is here, so when are data? The point is, data never are in and of themselves. The meaning and the substance of data shifts in the research process, and this process, it's important, starts long time before the researcher starts her work and be con continuously long time after she has finished. In a way, data freezes time. It attempts to freeze time at certain moments, yet, and this is important, I think, contemporary discourse ties this time freezing of data to the disruption and the further acceleration of academic work which is seen to usher in a techno-utopia of a new world order of openness that is imagined as total transparency, unethically unproblematic and rational participation and metric control and the purpose is economic growth. So where is trust in all this? We heard a very fine uh, expose on, on the role of trust uh, in, in ethics, in research ethics, and uh, there has been a lot has been written about the role of trust in science, most prominently by John Hardwick, on, uh, who wrote on scientific uh, the role of, of trust in knowledge, and he expressed it like scientific knowledge rests on trust. Trust, in that case, very much interpersonal trust, trusting the scientists between people. And that has been developed further, for example, by Steve Shapin, who very much developed how various institutions like peer review and uh, institutions and conferences and so on and so forth also help us to keep up this trust. But if you read all these open science documents and policy documents that you see, this is what, what, what you read is a, dis is a withdrawal of trust. 
So I think if we return to these two questions that I now think we can see very tightly interconnected, where is trust? And if open science is the solution, what is the problem? If you remember the Budapest Open Access Initiative, there it was researchers' willingness to share that underpinned the idea of openness and the barrier was technology or publishers. But now, the publishers and similar sort of private providers of, of infrastructure and technology, they are the solution. So, if open science is the solution, then what is the problem in these open science documents? The scientists, it seems, the scientists are framed as the problem, they are the, the, the problem that needs to be attended to, that needs to be solved. They are too slow, they do too little, they are not collaborating, they are not sharing, they have the wrong cultures, they are only incentivized to advance their careers, they do unethical things, they commit fraud, and they are in themselves barriers to openness. And I think, and I wonder if this is just. And I also wonder if promoting the concept of open science by undermining trust in the people doing it is, and promoting, in fact, a further mistrust is actually, in fact, dangerous in the today's times uh, that we started out discussing in the first place. So, um, I managed <laughs> to do it in time, I just saw. But I think this is a very important question to ask ourselves. Who, what is, if open science is the, pro the solution, then what is the problem that, is, that it says it is solving? And really, in, in the documents that I read, the problem seems to be the researchers. And I really wonder if this is what we actually want. Thank you. <laughs>